This is Victorious De Costa, and I'm on a Better Day Show podcast. Welcome, Victorious, on the Better Day Show podcast. We're just going to jump right into it, man. I got into making film because as a DJ and a manager of artists, I was shooting a lot of behind-the-scenes footage, and I also was producing music videos. So it was kind of like a natural transition once I stopped dealing with music to go right into film. And what are you working on right now as far as, you know, film? Well, what's, what's going on right now is I have a film that I'm a producer of. It's called Yusuf Hawkins, Storm Over Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be premiering on HBO on August 12th. And it's a story about Yusuf Hawkins. Yusuf Hawkins was a 16-year-old boy who was murdered at Bensonhurst uh, in 1989. So telling that story, and that's directed by uh, Muta Ali. Okay. Excited about that. No doubt. What is it exactly your role, you know, in making well, that film? Well, I'm a producer of the film, right? And so producers do a, a variety of things. Uh, but I, I can say that I'm I'm the first creative person on the project, per se. It was pitched to me initially uh, through social media. Someone hit me up. His name is Charles Darby. He's one of Yusuf's friends. He hit me up and told me he wanted to do a film about his... Uh, his friend Yusef Hawkins, and I'm like, oh, I know that name. So um, I helped Charles with the uh, initial research. You know, together we dug up a lot of the people who were witnesses to the to the event, and then uh, I helped him find the director, Muta Ali, who I already had a, a working relationship prior. So with that, you know, to scheduling interviews, you know, managing locations, and really my job is to help the director manifest his creative vision and keep him you know stress-free as much as possible so from development which is the forming of the idea to Mm post-production um to even now now that the film has been done for some months now still a lot of work to do as far as marketing the film so working with with uh hbo as well as well as our partners lightbox and abff and making sure that the film has big impact so okay. that that's like in a nutshell. Only going to be licensed to HBO, or you guys gonna spread it to all the digital uh, platform? Okay, okay. So right now HBO is showing it in uh, U.S. and Canada, and as far as where it goes next, you know, uh, only the future can tell. But I do expect that after it does come out and the world sees the impact of this film. I'm sure it is going to spread to different platforms. Right now, though, it is a proud HBO documentary film. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. So with with, with this, we are independent brothers, like the, the team, you know, four guys mm-hmm. that, that we work with. But we quickly got snatched up, you know, in a, in a positive way mm-hmm. by, you know, several companies. You have ABFF, which is the American Black Film Festival. Okay. So they had a, um initiative with a company called Lightbox, who did the Whitney doc, did the LA-92, some other docs, right. and it was for diversity. So we worked with them, and then National Geographic funded, you know, the um, our, our demo, you can say, the development reel and everything. So after that, HBO picked it up. So even though we, you know me, we, we indie, it still is, is like a, a very large thing. So, you know, it won't be on... I imagine it would not be on... Um, at this point on Netflix or YouTube, right now it's HBO documentary film. And you know how HBO does with, with their films. They, they, they there forever. But um, So who knows what's going to happen. Right. But this is different than, like, say, my previous film, Digging for Wolden Ravine, where it's like, yo, I'll show it wherever y'all want me to show it. You know, so um, I'm very happy with the partnership with HBO. And if, if it lives there for a long time, I'm happy with that. And it's cool because even if you don't have HBO... There will be a lot of ways to see this film anyway, because HBO is very, very um, much in, involved in making sure that the community sees it at large, and not just if you're an HBO subscriber. Right. You know, I know you were involved pretty heavy as far as management. You know, mm-hmm. let the people know some of the people you were managing. I think I worked with Joel Ortiz. Um, for two years, I think it was, between 05 and 07, I happened to be at the, the Justos, 
I was outside of the Jesto's Awards, which I, I'm a proud recipe. recipe to Jesto. I'm a proud nominee uh, of a couple of awards. We ain't win, but we nominees, though. Outside of the Jesto's, and I was promoting my group, True and Living, and I just seen, like, 30, 40, mostly Puerto Rican dudes outside yelling out Joel Ortiz. And I'm like, I know that name from vinyl, you know what I mean? And um, well, he was Joel Quickman then, in a pretty ugly single. And I, I met his manager, Dennis Wynn, and I was like, yo, who is this? And I found out it was the same guy that I already had his vinyl from the past. And he had a mixtape called Who the Fuck Was Joel Ortiz? And um, Jen, Dennis and I just connected, you know? And he was getting his feet, you know, wet back in, in the game because he just came back from, you know, uh, what they call vacation. And he wanted to, to really push Joel. And I, I, I made a move. I made a move with my group, with Joel, in that they wanted something for Joel's career. I wanted something. And I kind of did like some flim flam, slick manager stuff. And Dennis appreciated the fact, you know, that what I was able to do. Um, for my group, and he said, "Let me come over here, and work with us, and do some of that with us." And so I was um, kind of Dennis's, um, you could say, his assistant. In that, other folks in that team was uh, Mike Haran, um, homeboy Munz, and he had a, a great support system. Uh, Joel did. So I was there uh, before the uh, the Koch deal, and uh, until a little bit after the uh, the aftermath deal. And that's when I got with Shaw, and Shaw recognized the things that. I did with Joel, and he said, do that for me. Again, it's the whole thing, do that for me type of thing, yeah. you know, um, which I, I'm proud to be associated with these great talents, you know what I'm saying, to be in a fly, a fly on the wall. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, great, great MCs, those are two phenomenal MCs. Oh, yeah. You know? There's this song that mm. I, I just can't stop playing this one song. I don't. Okay, I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of his music, but this one song, uh, Back of, back back of, of the, the bus. bus, man, tell me about this song, man. <laughs> I don't know, I love, I love that song, you know, and, and I, I just, I, I just like, no, nah, I gotta ask Vic about that song, Back, back of the Bus. Cool, man. Back of the Bus was from a mixtape that we did called March on Washington. Mm -hmm. What we did was we did a mixtape every month with Sha, so uh, for a year. And March on Washington was a joint like that's more like political heavy. And Sha did a joint called Back of the Bus. I forget who produced the beat. and But on the remix, we got Hassan Salam um, for that, who is now my brother-in-law. Uh, but Back of the Bus, the beat was so ill. Sha... It was like comparing the civil rights struggle to someone nowadays who might be a little bit apathetic to politics, but still had some sort of awareness of why it should matter to him. It was kind of like a real honest piece. It wasn't. It wasn't about him being the most revolutionary person. It wasn't about him being the most ignorant person. It was him just really acknowledging the struggle before him, and. And being honest, though, about him not really being active in it kind of predates some of what J. Cole is known for. J. Cole also is a big fan of Shah Stimbala. Two people, Drake and, and J. Cole, were, were, were people that tried to reach out to Shah Stimbala for work back um, before I was managing him. Uh, he, Stimbala is like really the godfather of a lot of music that's out right now. No, but... Yeah. You no, know, that, that. So back of the bus. Yeah. You you hear that song? You can kind of cry sometimes to that yeah. to that song. A lot, a lot on that tape. Yeah. Try not to cry. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> try not to cry. Hey, man, it's were, a great song. Were you, were you orchestrated as far as um the you know the the little skits that was in the intro and and and, and the part of the song? Yeah, I would consider myself as a DJ. You know, I wasn't talking. During on my mixtapes, wasn't yelling, wasn't doing shout outs. So my contribution was writing, you know, the skits, whether it be original skits or I'll find for some movies, some clips. And so it was kind of like an early documentary style, you know, and which the, the mixtapes were soundtracks to my documentaries, you know. Um, and there were some songs that we get together and they'd be like, well, I think this beat says this, you know, and then Shy would 
sometimes take that advice and he'll craft a song around it. Because Shaw is like, is a machine, you know what I'm saying? Like right. you can tell Shaw to make a song about anything and Shaw can do it very well. And so I was able to get my, my creative juices in in that process. But yeah, but but just sampling a lot of the archive stuff for the for the uh the music and creating some sometimes like soundscapes, creating yeah. street noises and environments is something that, that um I perfected with using the with the A like mixtapes. Right. But it's something that we did every month with Shaw and it helps me now as a film editor, things that I was doing with mixtapes yeah, and, and right. it's you watch like, when mm-hmm. like a collage. Yes, and it's a sound collage, right? So if you watch mm-hmm. Dig- Digging for Walter Nervine, for me that was the big mixtape, you know, how I edited it. And people liked that. You know, it was it wasn't conventional at all. I don't know conventional. I got thrown out a couple of times at the school, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so all I know is is how I would make a mixtape and how I would DJ a party and that that's how I um that's how I, I edit life. Okay. So how did you end Oh, up I'm work? sorry. And I was road man I'm sorry, I was gonna say I was road oh. manager for uh for A Likes and, and Ray Six. I see you have the A Likes t shirt on, but yeah, I was road manager oh, yeah, for yeah. for a while. Yeah, I had to pull that one out. You know what I'm saying? Right. And weekend money. You know, so it's, it's all coming back. I, I've suppressed the film business, but I also was road manager for weekend money. Yeah, true. Yep, yep. All this prepared me for, for film. <laughs> right. Right. And uh, how did you got into DJing? So I got into DJing um, as a child. I may have been 12 years old uh, in my father's apartment. It was a first floor apartment. Mm-hmm. It was across from the incinerator garbage room. And this is in the 80s. And a lot of people in the building were just throwing out their record players. Everybody's buying their cassettes. And maybe if CDs were around, they're buying CDs. Mm-hmm. And so every day I'm taking out the garbage and I'm grabbing records. And that started my, my record collection. My father was a, a, a electronics buff, and he had two turntables and, and a couple of mixers. The turntables, though, they were like four or five feet apart. It wasn't like it was a DJ setup, right. but tables were there. And um, I put tables on the floor, and I started doing my own thing. And I started to do some pause mixing, um, pause tapes from Red Alert. Mixes online. Unfortunately, as a child, I, I may have sold a couple of tapes that really w- was Red Alert. Yeah. And but but quickly I'm though, sure I, a lot of people was doing. I think that. everybody did that. I, I don't know. You know, yeah. as a kid, it's like they see a lot of rappers. You know, first bit somebody's rhyme before they really. So um, then I started doing my own yeah. my own mixtape because you can't do Red Alert, Red Alert forever, right? You know. Um, so that was that. So primarily, I was doing parties, but I also did uh, a lot of mixtapes. Were you producing, like, as far as beats? I produced a few Shaw Stimuli songs, but I never really produced for an artist. Though, again, since, like, high school, I had been producing, but I never really put that out there. I am producing now, though. I'm working on a project now, actually, because why not? You know, you can see in the background, I got, I got the, the keyboard, uh, you know, so I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing that now. I, I kept it in for a long time. But um, through my last film that I directed, Digging for Walter Nervine, which is about, you know, a great pioneer in American black music, I, I found courage to start playing the keys, you know, a little bit more seriously and, and making music. So look out for that. I have a group called Cat Jesus now yeah. I'm working with. Did you go to school for uh, as far went as to I IR. Oh, okay. I went to IR twice. I got I got kicked out a couple times. Um is what it is, you know, but I went, I went that, long but, enough, yeah. though. I went long enough to learn how, how to, you know, uh, repair mics and how to splice the analog tape and everything. Uh, I went there, went Pro Tools was just now getting big. So we learned Pro Tools and the real to real stuff. Yeah. But they, 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 they threw me out of IR a couple of times, which is a story for maybe the book or something like that. Right. But I, I did go. I just never graduated, you know. Are you originally from Brooklyn? Um, I'm I'm originally yeah uh, I'm from East Flatbush you know I lived in East Flatbush I lived in Cheapside Bay I lived in uh, Fort Greene Clinton Hill mm-hmm. lived in Buffalo for a year you know but I'm from East Flatbush I'm from Brooklyn um, my parents are are from the, the Caribbean or the Caribbean you know my father is from uh, Panama and my mother is from Guyana That's you know what I mean that that made me black you know what I mean yeah. and um, 
part part of a long line of of uh, proud Caribbean people to live in this country and to fight for all of the African people in this country. You know, I don't see us as being separate, even though some might try to separate us. You know, but we've been here for over a hundred years, banging out. You know, against the system for the liberation of African people worldwide. You know, starting from Garvey. You know, on down. Even uh, Malcolm had had Caribbean roots in him, so um, very proud, you know, of of that. But I'm from Brooklyn, though. That's what's up. My, my neighborhood in, in Flatbush, they call that Little Haiti. I think officially, officially now it's called a Haitian whatever district. Like my area in uh, in East Flatbush mm. in the 30s okay. by Clarendon and all that. Yeah. yeah, I gotta I gotta check that out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mad Mad Bread bakeries <laughs> and yeah, all that. Down. Word. Yeah, man. Since you mentioned uh, Malcolm, and you were you doing um, any work with RBGs with Dead Press, or was it just A L I S? Nah, well, so so work. So I met I met Dead Press. I met uh, M One and Stick in '98. Uh, funny, I just came back from Atlanta. I was politicized working with an organization down there, which I won't mention. And I, I, I needed friends and I needed people I could ally with because I hadn't been home for a few years. Mm-hmm. And I heard, I heard M1, uh, no, I heard someone talking about, about Dead Press. They, got, they, they just got locked up and they mentioned the people on me. And I'm like, oh, I got to find these guys, people on me. I got to it sound like they, they want some stuff. Right. And I saw M in front of Mega Evers one time because I was going there and they was in Crown Heights pretty much. I always see Stick or M on a train, whatever. I saw M. And I said, yo, I heard about this organization that, that, that you went. I'm trying to get down with that. I forgot the name of it. So I'm thinking people on me, but he sent me to Yuhuru Movement, which he actually was the uh, chapter president you know, of Yuhuru Movement or the National Political Democratic Yuhuru Movement, which was founded by the African Social, African People Socialist Party. I'm sorry, I may, I may have gotten that... Uh, them, them letters mixed up mm-hmm. but um so i became a member of of uhuru you know in Pedum, and and you know that so that whole people army collective w- w- infused you know um in, in Pedum. and i met a likes in 99 2000 but we didn't really connect because they they were on something different you know um and their music will tell you what they were on they were on something different, you know, I was more towards the political side. And um, eventually, of course, even though RBG, as you know, it started in, in Oakland, but as far as, you know, in New York, what is known as the RBGs, you know, the Revolutionary But Gangster, that that morphed from um, People Army, you know, you could say. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And though, you know, M and, and the other brothers, People Army, they had connections to, to both coasts and also, also Chicago. So all this, the RBG thing was really in tune with uh, uh, the Uhuru movement, you know. And so it wasn't until oh five, I think, that I started getting down with A Likes because Supreme, who was their manager, I had met Supreme when I was in Atlanta. Is ninety five. I was I was eighteen when I met Supreme, and so he asked for some help with uh, his group, and I went to a studio session. I think Bilal was singing. Um, I forget the name of the song. I think unlike one of the songs they were singing. And uh, I just never left the studio. And Ness and I became fast friends. And uh, so I guess my, my entryway to the uh, RBG Collective came from those ways. But also Divine, Divine RBG, who I, I'm, you know, I'm a 5 percenter, and, you know, as is he, Divine is the one that kind of pulled me, you know, into the mix more than anything. So I said all these, I mean, you couldn't be political and be in Brooklyn, you know, and, and not be somewhat connected to, to RBGs. Uh, DPs and connected yeah. to yeah, RPGs. And then, right. you know, obviously it became like all movements. It became bigger than the actual people, you know, who founded it and became, you know, a, a bigger thing. Um, yeah, because that's mm-hmm. how I ended up um, producing Murder Me for Air Likes. Um, you know, like you were saying, I met Supreme, and he told me that he was working with Air Likes, and he needed some beats. 
So mm-hmm. it was around the same time, you know what I'm saying, like the mid-2000s. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I heard about Dead Prayers. You know, um, I, I used to go back and forth 